Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So here is Paul. He's come into the city of Corinth, which is in Greece, which is known as Achaia or Achaia or Achaia. And he's met up with a couple named Aquila and Priscilla. And they are tent makers, so that is their trade. It reveals here that that's also Paul's trade. And so this is the first time we actually hear about Paul being a tent maker. And so Paul would have heard about these guys, and he goes and he finds them and ends up working together with them. Paul had this trade which was really handy, and he could use it at times when he needed money. There were times when the church actually supported him financially. People took up offerings and sent him offerings. There were other times when he supported himself by making tents. And so while he was working with Aquila and Priscilla and making tents, he was also going in on the Sabbath days and reasoning in the synagogues and preaching the gospel to the Jewish people that were here in Corinth. And so we see in the synagogues there's Jews and there's also Greeks, which would have been converts to Judaism. And verse 5, When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, remember they were still in Berea when Paul had to flee, but when he arrived in Athens, he had given word for Silas and Timothy to come and rejoin him. And so they join up again here in Corinth. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. So this seems to indicate that when Timothy and Silas arrived, Paul then actually dedicated himself with preaching the gospel. So perhaps he was doing that full time. He was making tents before, but perhaps Silas and Timothy took over from him so that he could dedicate his time just to preaching the gospel and testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ or Christ is Jesus. Verse 6, And when they opposed and reviled him, as they always seem to do, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshipper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. So that's a little bit awkward. The Jews from that synagogue were opposing Paul, but the very ruler of the synagogue, he gets born again and becomes a follower of Paul. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So that's the Gentiles. Paul is starting to reach Gentiles now. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So this is a wonderful, reassuring word from Jesus to Paul. This is the middle of the night. Paul often has these encounters with God and these visions in the nighttime, supernatural things happen. And so Jesus just reassures him, says, don't worry, go on preaching, don't be afraid. No one is going to attack you and no one is going to harm you. And that is a great word because there were many Jews that were opposing him. And these Jews can be quite vicious and quite dangerous. But here Paul has this strong word from Jesus, don't be afraid, don't worry, go on preaching. And so he stays for a whole year and six months preaching the gospel and a church or many churches were being established in Corinth. Verse 12, but when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia or Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. And so these religious Jews were appealing to the Roman government to try to do something about Paul and hopefully put him in jail or execute him. But remember the word that Jesus had given Paul probably a year and a half ago, that no one's going to attack you or do any harm to you. And so it's quite interesting what happens here. Verse 13 saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, 
If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So Sosthenes was also a ruler of of a synagogue. So he's obviously another ruler that's been converted to Christianity. So no wonder these religious Jews were really upset and angry because all of the synagogue rulers were turning to Christ. Paul was leading them to the Lord. And so these religious Jews were losing control. And along with them, many of the Jews from the synagogues would have been turning to Christ. And it's interesting that they beat up Sosthenes and not Paul. I mean, they had brought Paul before Gallio and to this tribunal and they have this opportunity to beat him up, and yet they beat up Sosthenes. And I believe that's got to do with the word that Jesus gave Paul. Carry on preaching, don't worry. No one is going to attack you and be able to harm you. And so I believe the Jews would have attacked Paul if they could have, but there was something stopping them from doing that, and that was God's supernatural protection. And so these Jews had hoped to get the proconsul Gallio on board with them and use his power and authority to get rid of Paul, but he just threw it out. He rejected it. He's not even interested in it because actually under Emperor Claudius, we read before, he was driving Jews out of Rome. And so this would have disseminated throughout the Roman Empire. They were starting to turn on Jewish people and persecution against Jewish people was starting. And we see that eventually that plays out very horribly in AD 70 when Rome destroys Jerusalem and kills many, many Jews. Verse 18 after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. So Paul wasn't phased by all of this persecution. He was under supernatural protection of God. And then he decides to head back to Syria. So that is where Antioch is, his base church. And he's going to take with him on his journey, Priscilla and Aquila. At Sancria, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. So Sancria is the next city over from Corinth. And while he was there, Paul cuts his hair, would have shaved his head to fulfill a vow. Now, this is literally the only thing the Bible says about this in, at this stage. So we don't really have a lot of information and why Paul would do this. We know that Paul didn't value Judaism practices for himself in order to save himself. He was well established in the grace of God faith alone in Christ. I suspect this was something that he did in order to gain favor with Jewish people and to gain access or a rite of passage so that he could then take the gospel and preach to them. We know in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, I'm not under the law, but I became as one under the law in order to reach those who are under the law. We know that Paul was accepted into synagogues and able to speak into synagogues. And this was because he was a Pharisee and he may have even dressed in all the garb of the Pharisees in order to gain access so that he could preach the gospel to them. He didn't do that because he had a value in it. He literally did it as a rite of passage. I believe this was about gaining access to a Jewish audience, just like he circumcised Timothy so that he could take Timothy into the synagogues he didn't do it because he valued circumcision. Paul makes his stand and his views on circumcision and Judaism very clear. And he's not into it at all. Verse 19. And they came to Ephesus. So now they've crossed the sea to Asia Minor. Previously, the Holy Spirit didn't let him go into Ephesus, but moved him on into Macedonia. And so Paul has done a full circle around Macedonia through Corinth. And now he's come back to Asia Minor and to the city of Ephesus. And he left them there, that's Priscilla and Aquila. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And we know that this is Paul's modus operandi. Whenever he went into a new town or a city, he would always go to the synagogue first. That was his first point of access into a town. He'd preach to them. Often he'd make some converts. People would follow him. But most times, the religious Jews would reject him. He would then go and take the gospel to the Gentiles. So he's doing the same thing here in Ephesus. Verse 20, when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I'll return to you if God wills. 
and he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. So this is Paul completing his second apostolic missionary journey. And now he's returned to Antioch, his home church, his base church. And after being there for a while, then he now heads out on his third missionary journey. And chapter 18 here just goes straight into that in verse 23. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So this seems to be a pattern of Paul. He would go into a region, preach in the synagogues, start a riot. A lot of people would get saved. A lot of people would persecute him. He would go to the Gentiles, preach the gospel. Many would get saved. He'd plant a church and then he'd move on to the next town or city or region doing the same thing. Then he would return to Antioch for a while and then he would go back out to the churches that he'd established and he would strengthen them and encourage them in the faith teach into them and he'd go through all of the churches that he had planted and then he'd start going a bit further again with the gospel and so here now he starts his third missionary journey heading back to these galatian churches and this is the third time that he's been to these galatian churches verse 24 now a jew named apollos a native of alexandria came to ephesus he was an eloquent man competent in the scriptures he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. In other words, he hadn't been filled with the Spirit. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Apollos is quite an amazing man. He's very eloquent very educated and he knows the scriptures and he's preaching about Jesus but he doesn't have the full picture he doesn't have a full understanding of the gospel of grace and about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and so Priscilla and Aquila they pull him aside and they explain to him the way of God more accurately so if he was really amazing before imagine how extraordinary he will be now that he has a fuller understanding of the gospel and when he's baptized in the Holy Spirit Verse 27, And when he wished to cross to Archaea, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So here is this amazing man, Apollos. He's just arrived on the scene and he is now a formidable force in the church. He is educated, he's articulate, and he becomes just a great value to the early church, becomes a real teacher to help strengthen churches in sound doctrine and refute heresies and false doctrines coming into the church. And he just becomes a great man for the kingdom of God. And so here Paul is on his third missionary journey, and he's going throughout Galatia and Phrygia, and now he's about to come to Ephesus, and we're about to see some amazing things happening, some of the most phenomenal things in the whole New Testament. And at the end of all of this, we're going to see in Ephesus a large and powerful church.